Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Good night, I don't think so, but <laughs> who knows? <laughs> uh, I am chairing this session, Carlo Zappia. I will also present the, the third paper. We have uh, two more papers and I'll wait a couple of minutes in case somebody wants to, to, to get to the session, to join us. And the session is uh, called Keynes, but you will, you will see that, I mean, the first paper uh, uh, mentioned Keynes a couple of times, but uh, it's not exactly on, on Keynes, it's uh, on Walsh and index number, or the, um, I mean, the, uh, strange relation with uh, the literature on, of, of index number. So Keynes published uh, uh, something, of course, on index numbers and, and, and quoted Walsh. Uh, uh, so there is a relation, but it's not exactly a paper on Keynes. Anyway, I think I can start uh, because uh, everybody can, can join us when they want. Uh, so this is the session on Keynes, uh, titled on Keynes, but the first paper is uh, by Victor Cruz. Uh, there is also Cruz e Silva, of course. Uh, there is also a joint, uh, this is a joint paper. I don't know if the author, uh, the, the second, uh, your, your second author is around. Uh, and the title is Correa Moila Walsh Beyond Index Numbers from the battle of the standards to the science of money. I would give you from 15 to 20 minutes. We don't have discussant, official discussant, so uh, there will be an open, uh, uh, the, the discussion will be open after 20 minutes. Let us say that you, we all have from 15 to 20 and then 10 minutes of discussion and then we move to the, uh, to the following paper. So, Florio is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Zafia. Uh, let me just share my screen over here. You can see my screen, right? Everything okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, uh, my name is Victor Cruz Silva. I'm very excited and very honored to present my paper uh, with Professor Felipe Almeida. The paper is entitled uh, Korea Model and Wall Should Beyond Index Numbers from the Battle of the Standards uh, to the Science of Money. And um, as uh, Professor Zapia has, has said earlier, I'm kind of an intruder in the, the session. I'm not necessarily discussing Keynes, but um, there is some relation here, right? So uh, this paper has. Um, sprung in our, in our agenda almost by accident we were uh, performing another research and we stumbled on Walsh's name and um, it called our attention the fact that he was a very important individual in the, in the debates about index numbers uh, in, the, in the early 20th century but there was uh, very little uh, known about his, his life his work or or anything that could offer us uh, anything more substantial about, about his, his life and work. And that was our starting point, right? We tried to understand uh, the contribution Walsh gave to, to economics as a whole. And we, we were very surprised with, with some of our findings um, about that. His main contribution uh, is about index numbers. He's, he's a very important individual. In the field of index numbers, especially in the 19, from the 1900s to the 1920s. And um, his most important work on, on this regard is his 1901 book called The Measurement of General Exchange Value. It is the, the work that had the most lingering impact on, on the discipline. And uh, for, for that matter, the, the objective of the paper is twofold, right? First, we try exactly to uh, recollect 
Walsh's name in the literature on history of economic thought. He is there, he's present on the literature on history of economic thought, but always mentioned in, in relation to index numbers. And the, our second objective relates to uh, uh, I, a discussion about his incursion into monetary economics. And we are gonna argue in the paper that he was not necessarily an index number theorist. He was more than that. His work was more comprehensive than that. And then our argument goes, goes as follows. We, we argue that Walsh's work on index numbers were, was one layer of, of his work, his more comprehensive work on the science of money as he himself calls it. His gateway into economics was the battle of the standards, which we will we'll marginally discuss uh, in a in further slide. He starts his considerations and economics on the so-called battle of the standards. And that um, the work that represents more accurately his interests, that uh, epitomizes his, his contribution, is not his most important work, the measurement of general exchange value, but it is his 1903 book called The Fundamental Problem in Monetary Science. And we'll try, we'll try to defend that point. Um, so arguments that he's not a, simply an index number theorist, but a fully fledged monetary scientist. He, that, inside the science of money as he as he calls it. Okay, um, he had a very wide array of interests. Uh, Walsh published uh, 10 books throughout his, his intellectual uh, productive life. And he, again, was most recognized by, by his work on index numbers. And um, this uh, recognition came from several of his contemporaries, such as uh, Irving Fisher, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes, um, in an essay, he recognizes that his discussion on index numbers uh, owed much to Walsh's 1901 book, but also Wesley Mitchell, Ragnar Frisch, uh, Francis Edgeworth. These individuals all recognized uh, Walsh's contribution to the field of index numbers. And then we can find uh, sentences like uh, the first American who investigated the problem of index numbers in a truly scholarly fashion was, was Walsh. His work published in 1901 has remained one of the most fundamental studies on the subject and has helped greatly uh, to build up the science of measuring the purchasing power of money. And within this, this interest, we can identify something like two axes and we will fo focus on one of them, right? Uh, this axis of monetary economics, statistics, and mathematics, and another one that discusses political science, sociology, history, <clears throat> and religion, which is also something that may be explored in, in, future, in future papers. So his, his initiation in economics came in the Battle of the Standards. Right? The Battle of the Standards is the name he gives to the uh, sound currency debate that was very present in, in American economics and American politics um, in the second half of the 19th, 19th, uh, the 19th century. 19th century. Uh, this debate opposed uh, monometallists and bimetallists, and roughly speaking, monometallists defended that only gold should serve as a, a, a reference for the American monetary standard, uh, whereas the bimetallists defended that gold and silver should have a simultaneous circulation. They, they, they both should, should be allowed to coin, um, to coin money, right? And their, their arguments uh, were very deep and we will not be able to cover them, but Walsh had no resistance with the bimetallist argument. And the thing that captivated him the most within the bimetallist argument is the fact that this allegedly would um, provide a greater stability to the value of money. And this period, which coincides with what uh, David Laidler calls the golden age of monetary economics, which lasts according to, to Professor Laidler from 1870 to 1914, three were the main subjects discussed. And this, this three main subjects are, are defined by uh, de Boyer, de Roche, and Rebecca Gomes-Betancourt. 
And within this three uh, main themes, Walsh was involved in two, which allows us, we believe, to present him as a monetary economist, uh, properly said. He was involved in the determination of the value and the demonetization of money was one of his interests and the choice of the metallic standard, which he uh, starts to, to work with in uh, 1896, 1897. However, this debate, which served as his gateway, he claimed that it barely scratched the surface of the fundamental problem of monetary science. So this discussion should come only after a more uh, fundamental, more essential discussion took place to achieve a mean. And this discussion uh, related to the greatest stability in the value of money. And then he defines the fundamental problem monetary science as what kind of value is it that money measures and stores and should possess in a stable manner. Uh, this is the fundamental problem in monetary science as, as Walsh defends. So discussing the, the monetary standard per se was not, was not the, the main point here. We had to take a step back and, and discuss something prior to that. And the truly important concern here was the establishment of an ironclad definition regarding which kind of value, and he will work with, with different kinds of value, should be the reference for the stabilization of the monetary standard. And only then this um, accessory discussions uh, should be should be should be approached with that in mind, with that that issue already already settled uh, in the in the literature. And uh, in fact, this this distinction between kinds of value, and he will define four kinds of value. This confusion regarding the the idea of value is what he calls the original sin of economics. The original sin of economics is the fact that. The, its most important concept, value, did not have an ironclad definition, and that had to change, as he as he claimed. And in in that spirit, he wrote the measurement of general exchange value, his most important book in 1901, which is a very comprehensive and exhaustive uh, discussion about the most appropriate instruments to measure the exchange value. And the title of the book has in it exchange value, right? An exchange value. He will defend it in 1903 as the benchmark for the stability of money, uh, precisely because, as he understands, it's the, the, the most important one for the science of money. He does not make that defense in his 1901 book. He takes it as a given, and he, he resumes this, this discussion in 1903. And these four kinds of economic value, as he defines our cost value, esteem value, use value, and exchange value. His focus is on exchange value. So cost value, roughly speaking, uh, again, cost value refers to cost of production. Esteem value uh, gets really close to what we understand as uh, marginal or final utility. Use value uh, is kind of self-explaining. It's the, the total utility of, the, of that, um, that item. And exchange value refers to the purchasing power of any good, any, any, any item in, in, the, in the economy. And exchange value refers, therefore, for the power in a thing by which it procures for its owner other things. So it's uh, capacity to be exchanged for other things. And uh, in this regard, money acts as a common denominator because prices express precisely this exchange value as wash argues, okay? So he, his 1901 book, taking that as a given, tries to understand and develop methods to measure this exchange value. And that is uh, where his main contribution on index numbers uh, takes place. He, his 1901 book serves as a, as a bedrock for the, for the following researchers on the subject. Uh, Fisher's The Making of Index Numbers is dedicated to Walsh. It, what we came to know as Fisher's index numbers, Fisher's formula uh, appears in, in, in Walsh's 1901, 1901 book, even though Walsh does not make an, an extensive defense of this formula as Fisher would later in, in 1922. This is the gist of Walsh's most influential work and our argument 
is that this book was an accessory to the more important and far-reaching monetary discussions he would pose in the fundamental problem in, in monetary science, as his main aim in that book was to discuss the appropriate methods for measuring general exchange value in his 1901 book, right? The, the measurement of general exchange value. Um, meanwhile, the fundamental problem of monetary science aimed at a more primitive purpose, that is, to defend why we should strive for money stable in exchange value in the first place. So it is a, a, a previous question. And uh, in this regard, we may say we got lucky uh, because Walsh was a very um, reserved individual. He had no professional affiliation whatsoever. He had the records say at least that he had no, no family. He was not survived by any members of his family. So uh, finding archives of Walsh is, is difficult. We managed to find one letter from Walsh in Fisher's um, archive, a letter from 1934. And fortunately, it is a letter that helps uh, our argument in that sense, because in that letter, Walsh wrote to Fisher that that work, the measurement of general exchange value was written with the avowed purpose of helping to prepare for the future introduction of money cap stable in exchange value. So it is Walsh, um, saying precisely that the 1901 book it works kind of like an accessory to, to his most to his more uh, comprehensive discussions laid down in his 1903 book and in the fundamental problem in monetary science he claims that he argued for stability of money in exchange value that is for the stabilization of prices what uh, we have to do now is talk about the monetary scientist Walsh, then the discussions he, 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 he did in the, in the fundamental problem monetary science. And he believed that keeping money stable is the most fundamental precept which political economy can give to government for its regulation of the monetary system. So this is the, the most, important, most important task that uh, had to be undertaken. But in order for that to be um, achievable, the science of money had to teach which kind of value it is that money measures and stores. And then he will defend the, the exchange value as the, the benchmark for the stability of money. His reasons to do that are because money is a medium of exchange that interests people for its capacity to, pur to purchase other goods in his conception. And therefore, exchange value is the very essence of money. So uh, the relative values that money measures and stores throughout time and space are exchange values. They're not use values, they're not esteem values, they're not cost values, they're exchange values. And precisely because of that original sin of economics, which we talked about, this realization, this perception that exchange value was the most important kind of value to be, to be dealt with, had survived barely on the outskirts of the, of the discipline. Uh, furthermore, he also performs a defense of a very utilitarian uh, flavor. He, he will defend that money should be stable in exchange value uh, because it would generate the greatest happiness of the greatest number, right? And this would come into two dimensions, distributive and productive. Keeping money stable in exchange value would uh, promote a better distribution of wealth and would promote a greater production of wealth. Because uh, doing uh, this, keeping money stable in exchange value would be neutral from the distributive perspective uh, as whereas keeping money stable in sin value or cost value would not be neutral and would favor lenders, would favor lenders uh, to the detriment of the, the, the debtors. And, and so this would encourage people to retire from active enterprise, retarding industrial progress. So keeping uh, money stable in exchange value um, would leave to the workers their gains and would encourage laboriousness and the material progress of society. Also, this uh, stability 
we cannot have uh, prices. Um, how can I say this? We cannot have an overall movement of, of, of prices of exchange value in the same direction, right? If some things get relatively more expensive, some things get relatively more uh, relatively cheaper. And, uh, and this was not the case regarding the other kinds of value. So keeping money stable in exchange value would be uh, compatible with the rise in use value and a fall in both esteem value and cost value, which would indicate a, an overall progress or material progress of, of society. And this would naturally be, be positive for, for all. To conclude, therefore, uh, Walsh is not claiming with this that the, the other kinds of value are not important. He's simply saying that to the science of money, to monetary economics, the benchmark, the reference for keeping money stable should be exchange value, simply, simply that. And it is in that vein, it is in, in that pursuit for a stable monetary standard in exchange value that Walsh develops his discussion on index numbers as a means to measure the stability of money in exchange value. So what we're arguing is not that this is the most important or the most, uh, the, the discussion that had the most lingering impact in the, in the discipline because that is undeniably the, his discussion of the, the 1901 book. We simply argue that the fundamental problem of monetary science is his archetypical work, is the work that represents uh, best his interests, his concerns, and his overall uh, perception of the, the monetary economics, of the, the science of money, as he puts it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Again, it is an honor for me to be presenting this paper before so, so many eminent scholars of our field. And this paper is, this paper is currently, uh, we are currently working on a new version for a resubmission. So please, I would be very glad to hear comments or suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. And if there is uh, anybody who want to, Take the floor, he, she can do it. Uh, Marcel, of course. Yeah, yeah, I can ask a question now. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, I just was wondering because um, it is particular at that time, but I understood of the time that measurement was a way to get knowledge. Uh, but that's something different than uh, you think of theory. So one of the problems they had, he was not the only one, but or generally the problem people have is you have your theories, but if you want to connect your theories to the world, this 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 the measurement. And but but you think about measurement, you very often arrived at different kind of definitions than theory. So there's always this kind of conflict in theory and, and the definitions that you have developed to get the measurement. Can you say something about whether you uh, saw, observed some kind of these kind of conflicts in this, uh, in Walsh's work? Thank you very much, for Professor, for, for the question, Professor Bauman. Um, it is a very good question. Walsh says at some point that you can only discuss um, the theory behind the stability of money and, and, and all that if you have some knowledge about its measurement, uh, about its, its practical consequences or, or practical implications. Um, and, and he, he, he one of the reasons we may we discussed on the on the process of, of writing the paper is that he precedes now he, he he places his discussion on, on measurement before he casts his discussion on measurement before his theoretical discussion, which is like the, the opposite of what Fisher does. Fisher publishes the purchase power of money and then publishes the making of index numbers later, 10 years later. Um, 
he had to, he understood as far as you are concerned he understood that he could only make those discussions those theoretical discussions if he had a previous understanding of the measurement of the of the ways he had to measure that theory um, and he says something like that like okay in his debates especially his debates against Edgeworth in the 1920s uh, he, he accuses Edward of discussing theory without no notion whatsoever of the measurement of the index numbers, and he had not uh, discussed that uh, in a in a more comprehensive way, and therefore he was not he was not uh, I don't know if it's allowed allowed is maybe a very strong uh, word, but uh, if he had I, I, I think I'm going to go with the law because I don't have a better word than all. But I think that's it. He, he understood that the discussion on measurement had to be present in the work of anyone that wished to, to, to discuss the, the theoretical aspect. I don't know if I answered your question. I wrote that one. <laughs> I was not sure whether you it was the thought about it, and of course, it is also dependent whether you find something about the discussion about it. But well, uh, the idea that measurement should underlie any knowledge is the thing is he is that doesn't distinguish him from the other people, particularly with Irving Fisher. So he's very close to Irving Fisher. But even in Irving Fisher's case, if you see the um, the purchasing power of uh, money and his later book on index numbers. You see also that uh, there's this constant interaction between theory and measurement definition. So uh, the index numbers are differently measured in Irving Fisher's purchasing power than later in his index book. And so there's a move, but that has also to do with, of course, developing, evolving theoretical ideas. So you constantly see this kind of interaction, which, uh, so it is never, you can take snapshots from the history, but they doesn't tell you something about the process. So this, so but I just just I, I'm not expecting that you can answer this question, but I was just curious whether you have seen something about this kind of tension between theory and measurements. So that's uh... okay. Um, once again, let me... I see Mauro. Mauro probably wants to intervene. If I want to ask a question, yes, Carlos. No, I, 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 I saw you switching on the, the audio, so I, I thought you were. Oh, also. yes, yes, I did that, but uh, you changed I can it. wait. It's not my. Yeah, it's just it's... a matter of curiosity. This, this is a session on Keynes, and Carlo pointed out that during his introduction to the session that there were some connections between Walsh and Keynes. Uh, uh, what are these connections? I suppose Keynes referred to Walsh's uh, uh, work on index numbers. Is that a significant mention or just uh, a passing a reference to Walsh? Okay, um, let me uh, start with the follow up of the, the Professor Holman's. I will answer Professor Mauro's question uh, uh, about this process. What I what I this tension, this uh, movement in, in Fisher's work. I I wasn't I could not see that in Walsh. He he is very very uh, consistent in that in that sense because he in his works in the 1920s he will reiterate what he was saying in the early uh, 1900s. So the, he he does not have this this um, change of heart about uh, theory or about uh, the, the measurement. He reiterates it on, on 19, the 1920s debates. And about the, the Keynes connection, it is a, a, a weak connection. Uh, Keynes was, uh, he was awarded the Adam Smith Prize in 1909 for his, uh, I'm not sure right now, but he had something to do with index, with index numbers. Um, and uh, in his, his, speech and later in his treatise on, on, on money, he, he claims that Walsh, Walsh's 1901 book was uh, crucial for him to be able to, to 
do that work. He would not have gotten the Adam Smith Prize in 1909 if he hadn't uh, come with the help of, of Walsh in of Walsh 1901 book. And this is like the extent of the connection. The connection does not go much further than that. It, it stops right there, as far as we, we are concerned, at least. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And I think we can move on to John Davis. John Davis uh, will present a paper on Keynes' treatise of probability. It's the 100 year uh, anniversary. And you can see now the, the title of the paper. So uh, please, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlo. This paper originated as a contribution to a store up session organized by Carlo and others. I believe, Carlo, you had assistance on the centenary of the treatise on probability. And I've tried to uh, expand the discussion of the legacy of that uh, book by the words you see in the uh, subtitle. So this, this is really my goal here, but it's uh, not only Keynes I'm after, I'm looking at a Cambridge tradition, which I think uh, can be encapsulated in this, encapsulated in this uh, uh, framework uh, uh, originating in Keynes. So there's a, a number of sections. I'm going to just try to summarize the first part of the paper. I'm not gonna really talk about the changing uh, uh, influence and reputation of the, the treatise, but that is something that uh, I discuss. Uh, I want to talk about why the treatise is not as influential as I believe it should be. And I take this to be a matter of the influence of Leonard Savage and his uh, restriction of probability theory to small worlds, his concept. Uh, he excludes largely large worlds. Uh, you may know the, uh, the little remarks that he makes on this subject. He says, uh, well, at one point, uh, when we get to that bridge, that is, well, we have to cross a bridge where the world might not be small on the other side. We'll worry about that when we get there. So there is this distinction. So this is the first part of my uh, uh, framework. And then I want to talk about open and closed thinking uh, as a way of approaching economics. And so really what uh, I'm doing is pairing closed views of economics as a science with a restriction to small worlds and open science views of economics as uh, recognizing the existence of large worlds. But it's gonna be a bit more complicated because I, I'm going to argue we live in both. So, to the second part of the paper is uh, where I try to develop the open closed uh, thinking. And I go to Bertolanffy, who used this uh, uh, distinction to talk about different types of sciences. It's not something that's picked up on by people in the Cambridge School, but nonetheless, it gives a sort of a reference point. And then I talk about uh, Sraffa's uh, uh, thinking as he tried to develop his uh, later production of commodities uh, volume. And he uh, encountered a problem that he thought was a barrier to doing so in this uh, 1931 paper. And accordingly, he develops the idea of a relatively, not fully closed, relatively closed system. And it's only relatively so closed because it's open to distributional forces, making it uh, a different type of science. So that's really my target here is to take this uh, idea of a relationship between a relatively closed system and uh, uh, what is outside of it as a more open type of system and look at their interaction and ascribe this to not only Sraffa but anticipated in a different way by Keynes in his probability thinking. And then I'll make also some brief references to Wittgenstein in, the, in connection with language games because uh, Sarafa and Wittgenstein had an interaction which I think influenced both. And so the, the way I try to pull this together is to say that the uh, treatise on probability was a, 
early exploration of this sort of relationship between relatively closed systems, where that is the uh, more systematic part of our probability thinking with a long history by the time Keynes began to investigate it. Uh, but nonetheless, that uh, uh, domain, if you will, of thinking about probability also had to be open for him uh, in important ways, which I'll mention when we recognize the importance of uncertainty. So that's the second part of the paper. So let me do some foundational work here. Savage says we live in small worlds, or at least when we approach large worlds, we can rethink them uh, in the nature of small worlds. So that's where expected utility theory uh, applies. And with respect to what mainstream economics has become, uh, this gives the, our understanding of the economic world as uh, highly predictable and stable and ex excludes uh, thinking of the economy as essentially uh, crashing from one disequilibrium state to another. And I think if we get to the new classical economics and rational expectations in the Lucas critique, then the implication is we're always in equilibrium and policy by the Lucas critique is really uh, ineffective. So that's the large vision if you, you begin with Savage and you assume that we live exclusively in small worlds. And what we say about the market then is it's uh, uh, not to be particularly ideological here, but nonetheless, it's a, a, a self-contained sort of system that uh, really is, uh, we can represent fully in mathematical terms. Okay, so the, the uh, lesson I want to draw from this is that this small worlds analysis view uh, gives us a closed world view of economics as a science. I'm gonna skip this discussion of time. That's why I put all the bullets out here at once. I don't really have time to talk about it, but going back to classical philosophy, Greek philosophy, there's two ways of talking about time before, after temporal sequence. So in economics, it gives us linkages by exogenous shocks and going to the past, present, future flow of time idea. This also is in classical philosophy. Uh, gives us a static, uh, sorry, sorry, a dynamic rather than static view of the economy with endogenous connection between events and time. So I can't really talk about that. I talk about it elsewhere, but let me go on and get to the central goal of the paper is to talk about the open closed distinction. So Berlanti has a, he's a systems theory uh, figure, early systems theory figure, and he contrasts physics and biology. Physics is a closed science because its principles work in isolation from the environments they uh, are observed in and in the same way in all time and place. Whereas when we look at biological systems or living systems, uh, they're characterized by their interaction with their environments. And so he thinks that these are by contrast, open sciences. So well, that's the either or view. He is classifying sciences in this way. But especially when we think about economics, where we see considerable, what, closed science types of reasoning, but also how the economy is open to all sorts of uh, developments that are unanticipated by that more systematic uh, type of reasoning. We might ask ourselves, can sciences combine principles that work in isolation, but also provide a role for how environments operate. So think about behavioral economics for a second. They want to uh, do a systematic rational choice analysis, but the idea behind uh, psychology's uh, behavioral reasoning is that our choices reflect our environments. So we might then look for relatively closed and relatively open types of sciences. And then, to go back to the small worlds, large worlds distinction, then we might be looking at how uh, small and large worlds interact and are combined, or how so small world domains perhaps is an easier conception and large world domains combined. So let me talk quickly about Srafa. 
uh, he discovered trying to give a cost of production account of commodity values, this, this uh, eliminated the concept of the surplus. As a classical economist, this was his ambition to show how surplus was distributed uh, using a Ricardian type of cost of production analysis of commodity values. And these are uh, passages from his uh, 1931 piece. So he said, well, there must be a leak at one end or the other of that closed system uh, that is somehow in communication with the world. So as people know about the production of commodities, uh, his 1960 book, uh, he inserts uh, distributional values, that is wages and profits into the determination of commodity values. But there are certainly not things that we explain in cost of production terms, rather they explain, uh, they reflect distributional struggle. So there is a open system distributional struggle that impinges and inserts itself within the closed system. So this is a conception of an interaction between open and closed systems going beyond Bertolanffy. As he puts it, outside causes operate in. So he mixes those metaphors outside and in uh, to try to capture this. And the conclusion is the economic field is a rel relatively closed, highly structured system uh, affected by how distributional struggles operate uh, uh, from outside operate within it. So that's the sort of the general conception of open and closed interaction that I want to find in Keynes. But I'll also briefly uh, uh, attribute it to Wittgenstein with whom Sraffa was in uh, regular interaction across their time in Cambridge. And let's take the case of language games and then let's talk about this session as a language game, as an uh, illustration. So these are highly structured systems because what you do in a session when it's your turn to speak or when there's a Q&A follows uh, a set of rules that must be followed. So there's a systematic character. But as we all know, how we speak, the meanings that we uh, employ and how we respond to each other uh, re refers us to something that goes beyond this highly systematic type of domain that a language game might be understood to be. Uh, and we draw on this larger open domain of meanings uh, that uh, we insert from outside into the play of the language game. So language games are relatively closed and also open at the same time to this wider space of meaning. So that's the analogy to how Srafa talks about determination of commodity values where dis distributional uh, 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 effects are, uh, distributional struggle is, is incorporated. And if you, again, think back to Vitor's uh, talk, uh, if I may just try to jump uh, to, to back to that, uh, I think he talked about measurement uh, as a fairly relatively closed type of system. And in kind of response to Marcel's uh, question, uh, theory, uh, had kind of an open-ended uh, quality and how uh, theory could be brought to bear on explaining that uh, uh, relatively closed uh, systematic analysis of measurement kind of reflects, and I'm, I'm, I'm su suggesting this two domains and interaction idea. So back to Keynes. I wanna set aside some, I think, mistaken views about the treatise uh, he didn't abandon the treatise uh, in his later work. He never said such a thing, uh, nor as some people uh, suggest, uh, did he say that speculative behavior makes all our probabilistic uh, th decision-making irrational, uh, which would be the idea that the world is fully uncertain and open, and that's what speculative behavior Involved. So that would be chapter 12 in the general theory. And I think that's a misinterpretation. And Christina Marcuzzo, our esteemed to distinguish uh, fellow of the History of Economic Society this year, uh, has written some wonderful papers uh, with co-authors and on her own that shows that when Keynes did his own investment activity, he often used very standard methods of asset evaluation. 
So clearly for Keynes, when perhaps he was uh, working his bursar at Kings, <laughs> the, relative, the world is relatively close sometimes, at least up to some point. So now I refer to Carlo's uh, wonderful thinking about uh, Keynes's probability thinking. And uh, I'm quoting him here, uh, Keynes sought to develop a criterion for decision-making under uncertainty, alternative to the maximization of subjective expected utility. So I'm interpreting Carlo, he can correct me, we need to navigate those circumstances where we hit the boundaries of what subjective expected utility theory can tell us, where our standard tools break down and have also on those margins, on those boundaries, an analysis or a method or a criterion for decision-making under uncertainty as well. So probability can then be seen as a relatively closed domain or a systematic type of thinking about likelihood in virtue of the long history of its uh, development in a reasonably analytic fashion. Yet there's also this domain is, that is impinged upon it, that is all our thinking about uncertainty uh, because we recognize that many possible events uh, 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 really go beyond what that uh, more systematic analysis uh, will enable us to explain, a more unstructured, but nonetheless a particular domain of thinking. Uncertainty thinking is a domain uh, uh, and relatively open one. So here is the, the two topics that have been discussed uh, by many, including particularly Anna Carabelli, where Keynes found that uh, uh, well before Savage's work, that non-numerical probabilities uh, and uh, probabilities that really uh, can, do not have uh, estimates available to us, uh, take us beyond the relatively closed domain of probability thinking uh, to this larger open world that we also uh, continually occupy. So I'm, going, I'm coming down to my conclusions here. The mainstream uh, confidence in Bayesian thinking assumes that the world we occupy or economics is concerned with is small and closed and benign and predictable. So uh, my uh, complaint against Savage and the mainstream is that they misrepresent the, the world we occupy as small uh, and safe. But I think uh, now we have quite a record in the last uh, two decades, the financial crisis, the current uh, pandemic COVID crisis and the ecological crisis we face tell us that we live in a large world where somehow uh, there's unpredictable events that our traditional expected utility likelihood reasoning, our Bayesian, strict Bayesian reasoning uh, cannot uh, accommodate. So if economics is to see the world we live in as only small and closed uh, in some way, uh, and yet still large and open in others, then I'm uh, suggesting that the uh, meaning and significance of Keynes's treatise on probability over the next 100 years may be quite different than it now appears. So that's my view of the centenary of the treatise. I'm, I'm really trying to make a case for not just the rehabilitation of the treatise, but for there being a Cambridge tradition in thinking that Keynes anticipated, not using the open and closed thinking that uh, is explicitly used by Srafa. Uh, and, uh, uh, perhaps also uh, can be attributed to Wittgenstein, uh, a type of thinking that I think is uh, useful and valuable for our, our current understanding of what economics is about. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, uh, great paper, great uh, presentation. I, Thank you. 
I was part of this uh, storage meeting uh, where you already presented it. So please, uh, I see Marcel. You can get the floor, Marcel. Yeah, thank you, John, for your interesting paper. I just, uh, I'm just curious about a specific aspect you didn't really address, but I think uh, it's part of what you are trying to say. Uh, it's about control. Uh, well, Bertel Lanfrey was interested in the control, and so he was thinking about what are the, the domain of control in thinking about open and closed systems. And I, I th when I think about Keynes, then what I know of is that he also is thinking about the domains of policy in a very uncertain and turbulent world, particularly of his days. And so I'm wondering how, uh, and I also, this is another association I had with when I think about savages in small worlds. These are the, 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 the nice thing about savage small world is that they can uh, allow experimentation, which later was a later development. All the behavioral economics kind of experiments are small world experiments and never a big world experiment. But there's a the thing about control uh, issue here that seems to be underlying your story. Can you reflect on this, how that would fit into to your account? Or is that just what I'm telling, saying just now is just nonsense and it's not related to what you tried to say? You never uh, are only saying nonsense, uh, Marcel. So. Uh, the control concept is uh, sort of le left the scene in uh, uh, post-1980 economics. Warren Samuels and people in the institutional school emphasized the concept. And the idea there was social policy uh, has multiple ambitions. It's not just uh, changing certain types of economic arrangements, but it's uh, it, it, perhaps you might say an insurance sort of strategy where uh, as we go beyond where we have good control, we need to also uh, have strategies for where we have poor control, as in the case of the financial crisis and the uh, current uh, crisis and uh, alarmingly the ecological crisis. Uh, it's interesting, there's a kind of a, I, I, so I'll just suggest that it's a, it's a type of meta policy reasoning about systems that goes beyond our small world policy reasoning, which is a very, well, in standard theory, very efficiency uh, spillover base. Let's correct this little market problem. Uh, let's not ask ourselves about whether or not the markets can, mark the market system can accommodate significant challenges like ecological crisis. Uh, I've, I've read some and heard some feminists lately make some interesting arguments about uh, the gender view of control and insurance. And so there is uh, some arguments out there that, uh, that uh, behavioral economic surveys that say women tend to be highly risk averse. And then this uh, argument has been criticized. The evidence is not good for it. Uh, but what we can say is that perhaps men are overly uh, risk loving. And uh, so if we talk about control as the concept that you raised, we might uh, say, well, the whole idea of systems control is missing in our literature. And so this small world bias <clears throat> really makes it very difficult for people to ask whether or not uh, the larger systems with the larger domains in which our small world systems are meant to be efficient, if you will, uh, is, is forgotten. And the whole absence of the concept of control from uh, current economics, sadly, uh, is a consequence. Please, uh, John, uh, John Burdell. Thank you. Uh... John Davis. <laughs> um, uh, in an earlier session, Mauro's session, the observation came up that rational expectations in Lucas's system, the effects of it had more to do with the production function than they had much to do with expectations, actually. 
And I wondered, you, you characterized Bayesian thinking as closed, if I understood you correctly. And I didn't, uh, that didn't uh, quite resonate for me. So I just wondered when we put a Bayesian kind of expectation mechanism in a DSGE system, is it really the, the, the economic system that's giving it that closed characteristic or is it something inherent to a Bayesian view of probability is my basic question to you. I don't feel equal to answering that question, John. That's a, that's a tough question. Perhaps you and Mar Maro can speak to it a, a bit further. Uh, I, I, sadly, I missed the session uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, others, I, I think also, including Marcel, are quite uh, competent in, uh, in connection with Lucas. So I really will just uh, jump aside here. OK. I mean, just, just my basic point is in, in, in a DSGE system, there's only a couple kind of shocks that can happen. And we know something about their distribution, but I don't, I think that's just the way they set it up. Bayesian statistics ought to be able to accommodate all kinds of shocks that we know nothing about a priori, sorry. Oh, well, the, the theory of shocks, I, I can't say that I can comment further on that. Nice to see you. Since my name was mentioned, uh, maybe I should just uh, make a, a very quick observation here. Is that uh, in, in Lucas, he acknowledged that the DSG models, they are not able to, they don't work properly if you are not in the, the realm of a Bayesian probability. He acknowledged that. And, and the, uh, an explicit example of that uh, are the financial crisis. So Lucas was maybe we should say humble enough to accept that uh, the, the, the model was really restricted to certain ideal circumstances that are not covered by the events that uh, John Davis uh, listed here, such as uh, financial crisis. And not just that, Lucas also acknowledged that uh, his own uh, macroeconomics uh, uh, are restricted to, to, to probably probabilistic statements and not to true uncertainty. And uh, I don't think this has been uh, 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 recognized enough in the literature, but uh, he was quite uh, outspoken on that, that uh, uh, true uncertainty, uh, although he referred to Knight, not to Keynes, of course, but uh, Knight and uncertainty is not part of his framework, really. I don't know if Marcel wants to intervene once more. So I cannot uh, step beyond my own kind of personality. So I would like to, as you said, a response to John Burdell is about uh, Bayesian, in my view, Bayesian thinking is small world thinking. And that means that the, 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 the evidence that comes in is really in parcels of probability numbers. All the complexity is just brought back to a piece, a small piece of evidence. You see, so it leaves out all kinds of complexities. It's really about, like, uh, like actually, like DGE models. It is a very clear-cut signals. The world comes in into very clear-cut signals without noise, and that makes it actually a small world concept. So it's. Yeah. And that is not what I, what I understood, but John, John Davis, please correct me. That is not what I understood the way Keynes looked upon probability. That this was never a small world. It's always, it always also includes the, the complexity of the world and the certainty that comes with it. It's, I, I would say there's really a difference with that. Uh, apart from what Lucas says, or what he is just is thinking about Bayesian uh, thinking is very, yes, it's a small world concept. Thank you. If I can just, just, I'll just briefly insert, John. Uh, I, I suggest that Keynes, and maybe this is another metaphor too far, uh, we, we often are on islands, small world islands, but we, we have to navigate between them as well. So it's, it's not only a large world, but the islands are in the sea of, uh, of a large world, if you will. Sorry, John. <laughs> If I may say something before closing this uh, second part, uh, there is an issue here which hasn't been touched, uh, 
uh, if I understood correctly, uh, that is if Keynes' uncertainty relates to is kind of ontological uncertainty or is an epistemic uncertainty. Because if it's an epistemic uncertainty, if somebody claims uh, in the secondary literature, both uh, positions are uh, well represented, uh, the issue is one of representation. It's not so much of what reality is, but the representation of reality. And in that case, things are uh, a bit more complicated because if, from an epistemic point of view, if you don't have a clear idea of a small world, uh, it's as if you are in an open world, in a large world. Uh, so it's difficult to say if it's an epistemic problem or if any uh, ontological problem. But if it, it's an epistemic problem, the distinction between uh, uh, small and large world uh, in savage, in a sense, collapses because it's an issue of representation of the world. So maybe the world is uh, closed. Uh, uh, is small, but if you can't represent it correctly, if you don't have probabilities on this world, uh, it's difficult to understand what is different, the difference between the small and the large world. It's large, even if it's small, in a sense, from an epistemic point of view. And um, I mean, this is something that uh, is uh, uh, disputable. But there is somebody which claims that Keynes uh, did not talk of ontology, but only of uh, the epistemic issues. I, I think this uh, adds to the confusion in a sense. I'm not sure I helped uh, a lot. Uh, no, no I, I'm not sure whether you can see all the screens, but I saw also a question coming from Alexandra. Uh, I'm not sure whether she still. Uh, yes. yes. Sandra. Yeah, if we have time, I'm, I have a small question, but we can move along. Yeah, yeah, no time. problem. The, the next uh, speaker can wait. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks for it. I thought it was really interesting. I'm way out of my depth here um, concerning the authors you, you, you discussed. But I was just very curious because you mentioned your, your, the complaint that um, and there's some misrepresentation of, of, small, of large open worlds and small and closed worlds. And I was just wondering if you would be willing to tell me how representing the world as large and open could look like, just one that I can um, envision what this might entail, if that makes sense. Thank you. So the, uh, I'm, I'm inclined to say that the uh, small, uh, large, uh, pair and the uh, closed open is the representation, the, the first is the representation of the latter. So if, if, if we're talking about the worlds we occupy, that is sort of a realist view, uh, we're off to do our shopping and we know how the shopping works and the car breaks down. So uh, we, we can't quite get to that uh, closed world, that small world where everything is uh, nicely contained. We know how to do things. Now we're in a dilemma. And uh, what do we do? Do we call for help? Do we, so uh, I, by this little sort of uh, simplistic example, I suggest that we uh, constantly travel between fairly uh, organized small worlds that we know how to operate. And uh, However, those, as I was saying with the islands uh, metaphor before, uh, those uh, small worlds are in this larger world. Uh, well, you know, one thing that one reason that our economies and standard of living are as they are is that we've built institutions and systems to kind of keep uh, small worlds uh, available to us. Well, an attempt to, I'm not sure I got to your question. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now it's uh, my turn. So I, I hope you can see my, my slides. 
Uh, and my paper is uh, on what I call the most enduring message of Keynes' treatise on probability uh, uh, after 100 years. And so I will concentrate on a specific aspect which uh, is uh, uh, related to the relation between the treatise on probability and the general theory, uh, the two uh, main works by Keynes, but uh, explicitly in terms of the issue of uh, uncertainty and how to deal uh, uh, with uncertainty. And it is Keynes uh, who, uh, told us that uh, what was really revolutionary in the general theory was his idea of uncertainty and the fact that uh, we only uh, have the vaguest idea of any but the most direct consequences of our acts. And most of the time this is interpreted as kind of a verbal criticism. Uh, my claim in the paper is that uh, uh, in the treatise of probability, there is a technical criticism uh, of classical economics, of uh, a theory that doesn't take into account uh, uncertainty. And in particular, uh, that if classical economics is made by uh, pretty polite techniques, as Keynes uh, said, uh, we, which are the alternative uh, techniques? So I concentrate on uh, the specific aspect of uh, decision making and criteria for the criteria for decision making, criteria that rejects what uh, Keynes understood as uh, polite techniques uh, that are not useful in a world uh, uh, with, uh, with uncertainty. Uh, so the treatise on probability, uh, I, I try to, 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 to read it uh, as a, a book in decision making, in a sense, as it was from the very beginning. It was on the foundation of statistics, uh, and there is an entire chapter on uh, uh, how probability can be of use uh, when you have to uh, make a uh, decision. Uh, Given that uh, this is a, a reference uh, to, you can see a, a reference to, to Russell, uh, and Russell considered the, the, the treatise of probability as the most important work in statistics uh, uh, since uh, uh, then uh, logical chance, which was, that was 50 years later, uh, earlier. So uh, why not try to read it this way? And to do this, I start from uh, uh, the 50s uh, and uh, uh, Savage. And uh, so the, 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 the episode in which uh, mainstream decision theory uh, uh, emerged and, and the, the, the criticism put to, to Savage. And then I, I come back to Keynes, to the general theory and the theories on probability. Uh, in order to check what, for instance, uh, Savage said, because when Savage was talking of his axioms uh, and the significance of his axiom, he, he, he quoted Keynes. Uh, he quoted Keynes that would object to one of his axioms. This is strange because we are used to, to talk of Keynes as somebody who uh, didn't like mathematics. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm simplifying, but uh, the, the, our main, uh, I mean, the main uh, uh, propose, uh, the main proposer of Bayesian thinking uh, uh, mentioned Keynes uh, because Keynes would have object to one of his axioms. And uh, there is also another axiom to which I make reference in, in this uh, in these slides, these two axioms are important uh, to make it possible to have uh, numerical probabilities. And so you can see from here that uh, when Keynes was talking of uh, non-numerical probability, and I'll come back to, to this later, uh, 
he was rejecting something that uh, from Savage on uh, was then considered a standard axiom. Uh, standard axiom rejected by Keynes, and not in, in, in verbal terms, in a sense, but he didn't want to use it, and Savage acknowledged uh, this, uh, this fact. Uh, I, I move forward a bit because this position was criticized by, by Ellsberg. I worked a lot on Ellsberg. And there is something which is, uh, Ellsberg is uh, the, the main paradox uh, uh, with respect to uh, mainstream decision theory. And in particular, uh, he proposes, uh, a, he proposed a, a, a counterexample to the idea that uh, every uncertainty can be reduced to, to risk. That is uh, what we all know is made uh, uh, in mainstream decision theory. And if I can say something related to what uh, uh, Mauro said before, uh, Lucas uh, uh, says exactly this. Uh, the kind of uh, theory we are using is something that is OK for risk. And for uncertainty, if the kind of uncertainty we discuss can be represented as if it was risk. But if it cannot, my theory, Lucas' theory, is not adequate. So uh, they, they recognize this. Anyway, what is the criticism? The criticism is that in very simple situation, this possibility to reduce uncertainty, uh, something that is not actually uncertainty in the uh, in Ellsberg words, there is only ambiguity, not uncertainty. But even in, in cases as simple as this, it is impossible uh, to uh, to represent uh, everything as if it was uh, a risk. And what is less known, uh, uh, relatively uh, less known in terms of Ellsberg, is that he discussed Keynes. He did it not in his uh, original paper. He did it in his uh, uh, in his uh, uh, dissertation uh, that came the year after, and that uh, was never actually published until many years after. Uh, and in that dissertation, he found that uh, it's Keynes and it's uh, uh, Keynes uh, epistemic. Uh, uh, I think there is somebody with uh, the mic the microphone open. I, I can't see who, but please, uh, if, if there is somebody with uh, with a microphone, okay, I'll go. Uh, uh, so it's uh, Keynes epistemic Keynes epistemic approach to probability that Ellsberg sees at the beginning of the tradition, which is critical with him, of Savage. Uh, a tradition of thought that uh, critical of Savage in the sense that consider standard probabilities as inadequate to represent situation where information is perceived to be vague. So Esberg praises uh, Keynes exactly because it provides a theoretical approach that admits vagueness as an explicit factor without apology and provide a formal vocabulary for discussing it. So the people, Keynes and the people, the few people, Koopman and Good, the statistician who followed him uh, in rejecting standard probabilities, uh, they were providing a formal vocabulary. Uh, where is uncertainty in Keynes? Uncertainty in Keynes is, of course, in uh, uh, the general theory, the QJE article, uh, and uh, uh, most of the uncertainty in Keynes has been interpreted through chapter 12. I agree with John that chapter 12 uh, has been interpreted uh, not necessarily in the correct way. And I'm interested in a small part. Uh, what about uh, the agent who uh, in chapter 12 doesn't want, do not want to follow conventions? How do they, uh, take decision? How do they make decision? Uh, what kind of criterion for decision making would they adopt uh, in chapter 12? Because chapter 12 is about conventional, uh, the conventional judgment, uh, uh, conventional market values, as if there is no longer any uh, market fundamental to be followed. 
And so, for instance, animal spirits, which is one of the way out uh, of chapter 12, are simply a form uh, of irrationality. And what about uh, policymakers? How do they can take decision when uh, there, there, is the, the, there are these conventions, which are, of course, harmful because they can disappear uh, suddenly? Uh, uh, so probably we can come back to Keynes' treatise of probability and check uh, what's in there. And there we find, first of all, a epistemic approach to probability. This is important because uh, Keynes' approach is called logical approach. Uh, he is the, the, the founder of the logical approach. But logical uh, means uh, objective in a sense. Objective within a context in which probabilities cannot be objective in the sense of uh, the frequency theory. So it's objective in a, let's say, strange sense. The, 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 the Keynes uh, treatise is about uh, epistemic probability and, of course, uh, a specific kind of epistemic probabilities that are different from uh, Ramsey and Savage. Why they are different? Because uh, Keynes aimed at what we can say, we can call uh, a qualitative theory of probability. And his notion of non-numerical probabilities should be interpreted not as that probability do not exist, but that we need a different uh, notion of probability. And this different notion of probability is simple uh, in a sense, because it's a probability that is not a number, is not a numerical probability. But uh, if we move from a probability that is not a number to what else, uh, the first step is intervals. Why not? We don't have a precise probability. We have a range of probabilities. And if we have a range of probabilities, some of the things that you can do with numerical probability cannot be done. Your representation of the world becomes not a complete order, as is uh, in, in Savage, but a partial order. So sometimes you can say that something is more probable than other, uh, some, some proposition, some event is more probable than another one. Sometimes you cannot. Uh, and your order is partial or incomplete. And indeed, he, he mentioned it explicitly, this, explicitly this fact that uh, he doesn't want his ordering to be complete. And this is a, an ex-ante criticism, an anti-literal criticism of uh, uh, subjective, uh, uh, the subjectivist and subjective respected utility. Uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, critical part, ex-ante, uh, anti-literal critical part, has been examined uh, by many authors. My claim is that the positive or constructive component that one can find in the treatise of probability has been uh, relatively uh, less uh, examined. So I concentrate on this. And my idea is that uh, he, if he was writing about the foundation of probabilities as a uh, uh, Savage uh, uh, for 30 years later, why don't look at the book uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of what can be uh, a treatise, uh, uh, can be interpreted in terms of uh, uh, the foundation uh, of probability. So what is the constructive component in Keynes, uh, uh, in Keynes treatise of probability? The constructive components is made by a book, an entire, uh, I mean, a part of the book, part one, part two of the book, an entire part of the book uh, in which he states fundamental theorems. And these fundamental theorems are necessary because uh, he cannot use uh, the standard probability, uh, he cannot use uh, uh, the idea of numerical probability. So he has problems. He doesn't know exactly how to move on, uh, but he discusses this partial ordering. Uh, I skipped the, this part on, on night, and maybe I can come back later. The, my claim about Keynes and Knight is that uh, if you go to the constructive part of the treatise of probability, you find many things concerning uncertainty, while if you uh, go through night, you, you find the definition of uncertainty, 
and, and, and never an examination, a constructive uh, analysis of what uncertainty, of how to deal with uncertainty in a sense. So uh, the constructive component of Keynes. Uh, and there is also, uh, I mean, the idea that you must present if you want to start with the partial ordering, what about the decision criteria? What, the, what is the decision rule that uh, you can get from uh, uh, your theory of probability? And this is explicitly addressed by Keynes. Uh, this quotation is from a chapter known, but not used very much by economists, the importance of probability in chapter 20, 26, the importance of probability can only be derived from the judgment that it is rational to be guided it in action, by it in action. And a practical dependence on it can only be justified by a judgment that in action, we ought to take some account of it. And this is the reason why probability is to us uh, the guide to life. And this is not a verbal uh, argument because he then discusses uh, a decision criteria, uh, a decision criteria, a, dec a decision rule, and tries to mesh his probability with his uh, weight of argument into a, a coefficient, uh, which is kind of decision weight. So you, you also have an attempt to, uh, a, a specific attempt to distinguish uh, uh, expected utility, even if it's not yet elaborated, uh, as of course later, from something different. And he tries to provide something different. Uh, the last point, uh, and I'll, I'll be very brief on this, if is even if uh, I, I, one can convince, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm convincing in my argument about the trees of probability, uh, there, there is a, a discussion about uh, if Keynes uh, really uh, used it uh, in uh, if it's if it's uh, if it uh, if it is uh, sensible to use uh, the treatise of probability to interpret uh, uh, Keynes uh, uncertainty in order to understand what Keynes uncertainty is, and I have in the paper uh, the reference to this uh, discussion with. Uh, uh, with Townshend, which is well known mostly because Townshend, uh, uh, in the discussion with Townshend, uh, there is the analogy between the risk premium and the liquidity premium in terms of probability and weight, but also there is a technical, uh, we can say, discussion of uh, how you can move on. Townshend is the only one who discussed with, uh, with Keynes uh, uh, decision rules. Uh, asked by Keynes in the in the in the correspondence, and sometimes Keynes intervene in the discussion, uh, claiming, "Okay, why not uh, looking at this? Why not looking at that?" And uh, he, and sometimes he re referred to the treatise of probability, and not in, in general terms, but specifically to recall uh, to remind uh, uh, Townsend that he. He wants to work on a decision rule. He must take into account that probability are not numerical, and this doesn't mean that you cannot have uh, a decision rule with non-numerical probability. That you are looking for uh, a different cri criteria, a different uh, um, criterion. Uh, so I think that this is a, a, an important message, my favorite message from the TPA 100 years after. Uh, that the TP shows that uh, Keynes' insistence on, uh, on uncertainty uh, was, as the revolutionary element of the general theory, was not purely verbal, was based on the treaties. And so the treaties provides uh, what I already called uh, an anti-literal critique of mainstream decision theory. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I open the floor. Uh, I hope Marcel has something to say. <laughs> Thank you. 
No, I just I agree what you said. It's just an interesting thing is that um, it, 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 yeah, I, it is a matter about what what the way I think that what should be included in this is the way um, mathematics was considered at that time of, at Cambridge. And there was a very strong kind of idea, tradition, a very specific kind of tradition of mathematics uh, at Cambridge that must have influenced because he was in contact with the, 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 the people there that combined mathematics with philosophy and that was the interaction. And, and they had a very specific view on mathematics. So, uh, so it is only that I'm, I'm just thinking it's not, it's not so much a question, but I just much more comment that um, if we talk about mathematics, we have a very specific idea about it. Uh, uh, and uh, that doesn't, it's not necessarily the same idea what they have when they talk about what is calculable or what, what is a mathematical expression and what should it, what kind of knowledge should it uh, capture. You see that, in, so that is only that maybe you can, uh, let me turn that into a question. Maybe you can reflect on that. <laughs> Uh, yes, you, you are correct, of course, but uh, we, we must remember that uh, it's Russell uh, that argues that we must uh, consider mathematics as something that, which is not necessarily related to numbers. So there is a mathematics uh, which uh, uh, can be done. The mathematics is really important uh, uh, even outside the possibility of uh, precise measurement. So I think this is something that is uh, part of uh, what Keynes uh, uh, got from, uh, from the, the environment. Uh, I have two questions. So I don't know who, who first, maybe David, uh, who, who didn't. Uh, please, okay, David. Great. Uh, great. My question, Mike, can, everyone can hear me. My question, I think, is pretty straightforward. I, I'm curious about, uh, especially um, both John and Carla, either directly or indirectly, I think, talked about Keynes's concession to Ramsey uh, in his obituary. Yes, I think he is right so far as it goes. And, and I'd be curious to know what exactly, how far you think that concession goes. You're, as, as I take it, you both are, are, are uh, taking it as a fairly minor concession, but but I'd be curious to hear what you think. Uh, well, as far as my understanding of the, the discussion with Ramsey, he, he didn't really concede, I mean, he, he didn't uh, agree with, with, with Ramsey. He understood that Ramsey was making uh, a, a, a step forward in the possibility of measuring probability um, uh, but he, he, he didn't really agree with him. Uh, most of all, he, he never used the expected utility in his, uh, in his uh, way of dealing uh, uh, with economics. So uh, it's difficult to claim that he uh, surrendered to, to Ramsey and then he never used uh, any notion of uh, subjective probability in the precise way Ramsey uh, put it. So. Uh, this this is my 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 impression. I don't know if what John thinks. Yeah, certainly, his it was he was very limited in what he accepted from from Ramsey. But that's the interesting question here. Certainly, I don't think he's very clear that he didn't adopt Ramsey's approach. Uh, but he conceded something, and it sounds like sort of a big concession. Um, but just exactly what he did concede. I mean, I agree that he didn't. My adopt, my viewpoint but, uh, is a, a viewpoint elaborated by Bjorka Runde. And he claimed that uh, Ramsey made him, uh, uh, made him uh, thinking about the, the, the logical aspect. Uh, and logical is the kind of interpretation uh, of epistemic probability as something that is also rational. Uh, so that one was something that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, put uh, Keynes uh, in, uh, in a, in a, in a in, in a difficult position. But even if you accept that your that probability theory cannot be logical in the sense of gains, uh, 
the structure of uh, the, 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 the axiomatic structure uh, uh, is still there. Uh, it works. It doesn't depend on uh, the idea that a there is a rational a subjective probability, which is the other, the other claim made by, by Ramsey. Uh, John? Uh, David, I think his concession was uh, modest at best. The, the reasoning being that, uh, my, my reason being that the subjectivist uh, approach and the logical approach are utterly orthogonal to one another uh, in terms of what uh, uh, epistemologies can possibly be involved. So I, I, I really don't think that uh, uh, Keynes was saying more than, well, if you think that you can give a subjectivist point estimate account of uh, probability judgments, help yourself. I really don't believe that's the way people think in this world. I think that from my quote logical perspective, um, reasoning and uh, how we make judgments uh, has, uh, well, the other participant in our store up session would argue, uh, Carlo can remind me of my name, the name slipped my mind, uh, an intersubjective. Donald Gillis. Donald Gilly, Gillis, yes. Uh, Keynes was closer, to, as Donald says, to a intersubjective, quote, logical basis. And the Ramsey analysis, clever, no doubt, but I think the concession was modest in that respect. Okay. Uh, ah, here we have uh, Ricardo, please. Uh, you have to open your uh, microphone first. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I agree with uh, the epistemic vision of the of Keynes' theory of probability. Uh, what do you think about uh, what he thinks about the way of capturing uh, probability? He speaks about direct knowledge. Uh, Anna Carabelli speaks about practical reason uh, to capture it. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, well, my my quarrel with Anna is that Anna emphasized a lot the non-comparability issue, uh, which to such an extent to make uh, impossible in many situations to have uh, a, a reason to decide, uh, if not in many situations, in some very crucial situation. So in a sense, in the end, no, she, she doesn't agree, but in the end, uh, uh, Anna has an idea of uh, the importance of Keynes uh, very, very close to Shackle, to what Shackle was, uh, was uh, claiming. And I don't think, uh, I mean, my, my, my view is that uh, uh, the, in a sense, the range of situation that Keynes theory of probability, Keynes thought that his theory of probability uh, can, uh, can deal with is much larger. So in the end, uh, there is never a situation in which you cannot decide uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, it's, I mean, it's an issue of, uh, of interpreting the same, uh, the same part of the TTs and so on. So we discussed a lot with Anne about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I try to overemphasize, in a sense, the constructive part. I, I think that she, in a sense, overemphasized the uh, critical part of, of the treatise of probability. I don't know if I'm, I, I answered Thanks. the question. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed to all the speakers and all uh, the people in, uh, in the audience. Uh, I think we have to close. I don't know if the hand by John is still on because he wants to say something at the end, but uh, I don't think so right now. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And I think that in uh, 30 minutes, there will be an interesting discussion about uh, the code of conduct uh, for the history of economic society. Is it, this is something that has been already discussed uh, 
uh, there's plenty of hands. <laughs> ah, okay, this is, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks to you all and bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you very much for it. Nice to see you, John. <laughs> you too, Ricardo. Yes, I have my presentation at the same time that of yours, <laughs> so I cannot see you. <laughs> but well, it, it's a pleasure to see you in this. <laughs> you, you as well. Well, thank you very much.